This is the Canadian Mountain Podcast, brought to you by the Canadian Mountain Network. This is a special episode of the Canadian Mountain Podcast in honour of International Mountain Day. This episode was live streamed on December 11th, 2017 at the University of Alberta Mountain Festival in Edmonton. Hello and welcome to the Canadian Mountain Network's International Mountain Day live stream. It's our second year coming to you live from the University of Alberta in Edmonton. I'm Meg Wilcox and for the next hour I'll be connecting you to some of the mountain communities that are celebrating International Mountain Day. We'll be going up to Jasper, over to Victoria, we'll be down to Crow's Nest Pass and we'll also be checking in on some mountain webcams just like you saw in Marmot to see what's happening at a higher altitude. It was in 2003 that the United Nations first declared International Mountain Day, and ever since, on December 11th, today, communities around the world are coming together to celebrate and to bring awareness to the world's mountain environments and the people and cultures that inhabit them. And you'll be getting a bit of a taste of that today. And as you saw at that first webcam there from Marmot, that's where we're heading first today on the live stream. We're heading to Jasper, and Aaron Reed is joining us at Marmot Basin. Hi, Aaron. how are you doing? Hi, Meg. I'm really well, and how are you? I'm doing great. Tell us where you are. It looks a little busy behind you there. Yeah, I'm uh, currently standing on the Caribou Deck uh, in the Lower Chalet at Marmot Basin. It's a beautiful day here today. The sun is shining. It's nice and warm, much different to last year. Uh, Absolutely beautiful up here today. And you were saying sunny, warm. It seems like a decent number of people just coming behind you on the hill. It's been pretty busy so far. Yeah, it's a great day for a Monday. Everyone's out enjoying the sunshine and the fantastic conditions we have up here. We've had a lot of early season snow this year, over two metres so far, uh, with a base of over 80 centimetres as well. So really great conditions for the start of the season. And uh, yeah, we're certainly enjoying this uh, warmer weather for mid-December. It's about, uh, I'd say about minus one, zero degrees right now up here on the deck. And uh, yeah, just beautiful enjoying the sunshine. As you can see, there's people beside me here and around the corner enjoying their lunches on the deck here. And uh, yeah, really gorgeous bluebird day. Now you mentioned there's been a lot of snow this season. Can you give an explanation? Cause it has been a lot of snow that you guys have seen so far. Absolutely. Yeah. A lot of snow, uh, you know, it's beating our five and eight and 10 year records or average records for sure. Um, it started uh, with a big dump at the end of September. Uh, that sort of melted off a little bit and we got a lot more snow in October than we usually would. Uh, we, in fact, we over we had over a meter of snow when we started the season on November 10th. And that's one of our earliest openings uh, you know, in, in the record books. I think we, there might be one season where we've opened one day earlier, but uh, really, you know, great snow conditions, lots of wonderful skiing. As you can see, people coming down the mountain behind me here, uh, great coverage around the mountain. And uh, we're, we're very excited that we've started so well. So you've started well, there's tons of snow. I also understand there's 45 new acres of ski terrain this year too. Tell me about that. There is yes so uh we've opened an area called tres hombres this is an area that's always been part of our leasehold but we haven't opened it to the public before so marmot basin has just got a lot bigger we've got five new runs in that area really big steep advanced uh terrain it is our longest uninterrupted fall line at marmot basin so if you're an advanced to expert skier this is an area that you've really got to get in and see for yourself it's uh, fantastic skiing and riding in the and so you've got new ski terrain you have a ton of snow as you mentioned it's a bluebird day right now it looks like it's going to be a great season but what are you looking forward to most about it oh I don't know. I, I love everything in, <laughs> as a part of the season. <laughs> uh, you know, I, I always enjoy those powder days. We've been very, very lucky that we've had quite a few of them already this season. Uh, we'll certainly be excited to have more of them as we move into the season. In fact, I can see a little bit of snow on the forecast for this coming uh, sort of Thursday, Friday of the week. So that's very exciting. I think, you know, just getting out, enjoying the mountains, uh, being part of the mountain community, enjoying the, the town of Jasper, 
uh, you know, it's it's different. You get to escape the city. You get to come out here, uh, get that sense of freedom as you're on your board or on your skis and you're skiing around on the on the terrain. And I think it's really great because everyone can enjoy it, no matter what level you are. Marmot Basin has something for everyone, whether you're a beginner skier, never done it before, uh, fantastic lesson programs down here. Uh, we've also got, uh, you know, great different terrain for those intermediates, advanced expert skiers and riders. Uh, the intermediates will really enjoy the long carving groomers and uh, obviously for those advanced and experts getting into tres hombres for the very first time will be fantastic and enjoying places like Eagle East and the Knob as well. So Eagle East opened this week or last week and uh, some fantastic skiing and riding in there as well. Wow. Well, thank you so much, Erin. I'm feeling like a bit of a chump for being indoors when it looks so beautiful right now at Marmot. <laughs> oh, yeah. Everybody, you've got to come out here. It's really fantastic. Yeah. Right. Well, have a good day and enjoy that sunshine. Thank you very much and uh, happy International Mountain Day. Thank you. You as well. That's Erin Reed Bye. and she's at Marmot Basin uh, just outside of Jasper in Alberta. We're going to be talking to our next guest, Mary San Severino. So as we all know, one of the best ways to celebrate mountains is through photography. And the Mountain Legacy Project, it takes it to a whole other level. So here's a video that they put together that helps explain their work. So we have mountain peaks, helicopter rides, panoramic photos. It's a pretty sweet gig. And for Mary San Severino, it's a pretty much typical day on the job when she's out in the mountains. She's the research associate with the Mountain Legacy Project. She's also a professor emerita at the University of Victoria. Hi, Mary. Hi, Megan. How are you? I'm doing very well. And yourself? Not too badly. Not too badly. Happy International Mountain Day. Yeah, likewise. So where are we catching up with you right now? 
Well, uh, you're catching up with me right now at uh, University Hut number four, or University House number four. It's our little cabin in the woods uh, on the campus at the University of Victoria. It's a beautiful day here. And I was going to say, must be behind a, a poster right now, because a beautiful view behind you as well. Yes, that's right. Yeah, this is uh, Mount Assiniboine, um, one of the images that we re-photographed in uh, 2010 and in uh, just redid this last summer in uh, 2017. And it's uh, a duplicate of um, an image by Arthur Wheeler from 1913. Wow. So for you working with the Mountain Legacy Project, as someone has never in, been introduced to this before, what's your, your quick explanation or your elevator pitch? Elevator pitch. Imagine that it's uh, Canada back just uh, before Canada became a country. So you've got to make some maps. You've got a country, you've got to make some maps. And so map making pro progresses. Everything's tickety-boo until we hit the mountains. And at the mountains, um, traditional techniques for surveying were not very effective. They were very expensive, really difficult to do. So a new technique was developed, a made in Canada technique called phototopography. And this saw surveyors from about uh, 1888, actually our earliest images from uh, 1861, but the majority of our images, 1888 to, 19, to the mid-1950s, and they were taken primarily by surveyors standing on top of mountain peaks using the camera, that newfangled thing in the, uh, in the 1880s, pretty new, uh, called the camera, to help make, um, make maps. We figure out where these surveyors stood. We go back to the same spot uh, that the surveyors stood, retake their photo, digitize their, the historic image, digitize the modern image, and then overlay the two and make them available for mountain researchers of all stripes to use for their work. And we do a little bit of our own research too. So you have all of these old photos from those early days of photography and the exploration of the mountains with the development west. How did you find all these photos? Well, um, it, uh, it first came about with uh, Dr. Eric Higgs and Dr. Janine Remtula. They were working away. Uh, Janine was a, a, a graduate student at the time. Eric was associated with the University of Alberta. And they're working in Jasper. And the two of them are, are essentially asking questions <laughs> the way one does. And they, they, the question was, I wonder what the landscape in the uh, Athabasca Valley around Jasper looked like 100 years ago. I wonder how it's changed. And they uh, um, were guided to a um, they were guided to a, a box of uh, old photos taken in 1915 by Morrison Parsons Bridgeland. And they looked at them and they went, wow, I know where this particular one is taken from. And it was uh, um, uh, just above the, uh, the power dam at, um, uh, in Jasper. And off they went, took a photo, and the Mountain Legacy Project, it wasn't called that back then, but the Mountain Legacy Project was born. And we realized at that point that we had um, a real um, treasure trove of images and uh, um, just a legacy, if you will, to, uh, to, to work with uh, on our hands. And you have so many images now, and uh, I wanted to ask you from being able to compare today and, and past images, what are some of the trends that you're seeing? And we do have some images that we'll be able to pull up here uh, to show our viewers as well. Well, uh, of course, the, one of the big trends obviously is going to be disappearing ice. So uh, uh, you can see glacial retreat writ large on the landscape. Um, uh, that's, that's really noticeable. More subtle, um, but still pretty normal is so we have that uh, alpine um, uh, ecotone that look that that area around the trees just creeping up the mountains. Um, there's indications, of course, that's a that's a really complex process as to how that happened. But one of the drivers is uh, is a slightly warmer climate. So one world is one of the drivers that has that ecotone creep. So you can see that. You can see infill. That's a really amazing thing to look at. You look down in some of these valleys, on some of these slopes, and you go, my gosh, there were hardly any trees here uh, 100 years ago, or there were fewer trees, a lot fewer trees 100 years ago. Now they've infilled. 
Probably that is because we have suppressed or excluded fire from, um, from landscapes where fire was a big shaper of the landscape. And of course, we can see um, cultural and built history. Uh, we can see evidence of First Nations people on the land. We can see evidence of old railroads. We can see uh, evidence of, of, of the, the direct hand of man on the landscape and how that's changed. So there's lots there to take a look at. And uh, I'm wondering if we can put up the picture right now comparing the Athabasca Glacier uh, so people can oh, yeah, get an idea that. of the, the images yeah. and, and sort of what the comparison is. And uh, Mary, yeah. if you want to explain a bit the, the difference that, that can be seen. Sure. So um, the historic image was taken, actually this is a panorama of uh, three or four images. I can't remember how many I popped in there, but um, this is a panorama of images taken in 1917 by Arthur Wheeler as part of the Interprovincial Boundary Survey, so setting the boundary between Alberta and British Columbia. And we're looking uh, historically, the historic image is uh, the black and white one, and it looks down at this massive glacier, and that is the Athabasca Glacier filling the valley that today has the Banff Jasper Highway on it. So uh, if we turn to look now at the modern retake, that was shot in uh, 2011, and it was shot from uh, this exact same spot. You can tell if you kind of look at the rocks in the lower right-hand corner, um, it's they're they're still in the same spot. So it's from it's from exactly the same spot, and we see obviously a lot of glacial recession, but we also see a couple of other interesting things. In the um, mid right hand of the uh, of the image. There's a chunk of forest, and it that same forest was there in uh, 1917 as today. And it doesn't look like, maybe it's gotten a little tiny bit more dense, a tiny bit more infill, but boy, if I was a, um, um, an ecologist looking for an interesting site to take a look at uh, how trees um, withstand the rigors of those tough, tough, tough uh, alpine uh, ecosystems, I think maybe I'd go and poke my nose in over on that, that side to see. So that's some just a quick down and dirty non-specialist look at what's, uh, what those two images can show us. And I understand that, I mean, there's so many uses for these photos and the comparisons, but one of the other things is uh, that it's being used for is in terms of wildfire sort of analysis and suppression techniques. Tell me a little bit more about that. Well, um, one of the things that, uh, um, that, that uh, forest fire specialists look to do is they look to try and figure out what is the forest fire regime in, um, in, a, in, a, in a given area. And for the regime, that's the pattern of the fire, the intensity of the fire, the history of fires on, that, on the landscape. Mm. Um, for that sort of thing, uh, forest uh, wild, wildfire specialists need to look they need to look back in history. They need to know a little bit of the history. And so these pairs can help give a look back. You can see where uh, old fire um, um, evidence is, uh, is, is, is on the landscape and then compare that with the modern. Maybe uh, I would go and take a look. Maybe that's a place um, to think about a controlled burn. Maybe that's a place to go and look to see, well, gee, is there anything? Are there any geological features? Are there any features that cause this to burn but not the next spot. If you have um, uh, the images of uh, King Creek, that's a really excellent example of uh, fire on the landscape. And so for people who are hearing about this for the first time now, hearing a bit about the utility of these photos or maybe how they could contribute to it, how, how can they get involved? Well, um, the best thing to do is to head over to the Mountain Legacy um, website. So you can just pop Mountain Legacy in your browser and you'll be taken to our main website. And if you wanna just dive right smack dab into the images and get started looking around, you can go explore Mountain Legacy and poof, it'll, you'll be right there. Wonderful, well, thank you so much, Mary. And I was just wondering, would you be able to share with us, I don't know if you can turn your camera and just sort of show us a little bit the, the office space that you guys sure. are in right now. My pleasure. Yeah, so, so uh, we're here in uh, coastal, get a view out there. Oh, wow, what a backyard. So this, yeah, 
So that uh, sadly, we did not get any barred owls giving us a call today. Aww. But uh, that's our uh, that's that's our regular our regular view out. We're tucked into um, uh, a bit of a coastal coastal rainforest, temperate rainforest here, and we've got Gary oak trees, and uh, that's a big, huge Doug fir right out in front. So it's a it's a great place to great place to 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 work. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much for checking in with us, Mary, sharing your little corner where you guys are doing your mountain research and a very happy International Mountain Day to you. The same back at you. That's Mary San Severino, and she's with the Mountain Legacy Project. She's based in Victoria, BC. Well, let's throw to another webcam. We can never get enough mountains today. And right now, the one we're going to be seeing, or we see right now, is at Norquay. So Norquay and Banff National Park, not too far from the Banff town site, which is currently minus five degrees in Banff. So not too chilly, nice and sunny today. And that's in Banff National Park, the view of the Cascade Cam. And right there, we are seeing another cam and that one i am looking at the provincial one of the provincial parks it is also looking sunny and beautiful we'll just keep putting up photos of mountains and it'll look fantastic and uh just a reminder if you well you're probably online because this is an online live stream if you want to send or put out any photos of where you live in mountain regions your favorite memories in mountain regions the hashtag is mountains matter ca and if you want to get any more information on the live stream or anything else you might be watching us on facebook you can head to internationalmountainday.ca and that's where you can connect with the canadian mountain network and find other information about events that the Net mountain network is putting on for International Mountain Day as well. Our next, uh, our next stop is heading north now from Victoria, BC, about 15 hours north to Tumbler Ridge. The global UNESCO geopark is in British Columbia and they've also been celebrating International Mountain Day all weekend and it was Jenna and Sarah from the geopark that sent us this video update to show what they've been up to. Hey everybody, it's Sarah and Jenna from the Tumbler Ridge UNESCO Global Geopark. Uh, we're so excited to be part of the Canadian Mountain Network and celebrate International Mountain Day with our whole week-long festival. Uh, we started our festival on Thursday. Yes, uh, we got a presentation from our local geologist Kevin Sharman and he talked about um, the mountain ranges in our area and how significant they are to us. Um, and then we followed it up with our presentation on Saturday. That's right. So on Saturday, we heard from our local Tumbler Ridge search and rescue team. They, uh, they spoke about mountain preparedness and avalanche response in our mountains. And then uh, Sunday was a lot of fun. Uh, paint and wine night. Everybody likes that uh, mountain theme. So everybody got to do a painting of them, one of the mountain ranges in Tumbler Ridge. And then tonight is our uh, kind of our flagship item on our schedule. So tonight we've got Dr. Stephen Johnston from the University of Alberta. He's coming to talk about back in the 80s when he actually mapped the geological formations of Canuso Falls. And for those of you who don't know, Canuso Falls is our most iconic uh, waterfall in the geopark. So it, the water cascades over the Murray River, 60 meter drop, it's over 100 meters wide. It's just breathtaking. And so we're standing here also in front of our uh, Canadian, uh, Canadian Mountain uh, Artwork contest. So we had people from the community of uh, Tumblr Ridge all submit their entries. And when will we hear who the winner was? Uh, we'll hear that t tonight, actually. Okay, great. So the Tumblr Ridge Arts Council has uh, helped out with the, a number of the events. We've had some support from Wild River Adventure Tours in uh, promoting the heli snowshoe events that they do in our southern mountains and with lots of support from our community uh, hosting things at the community center here and at our local visitor center so we're so excited to be a part of this and celebrate the importance of mountains in our community and around the world hey happy international mountain day take care bye bye that was Sarah and Jenna at the uh, Tumblr Ridge Global UNESCO Geopark in BC. And that's actually what we were seeing at the webcam ahead of time, the Canuso Falls that they were mentioning. So a very breathtaking view and a beautiful day right now in Tumblr Ridge. Currently six degrees up in Tumblr Ridge, nice and sunny. 
and uh, we'll hit up to another webcam. So there's Sunshine Village, so also not too far from Banff and based in Banff National Park. A nice, beautiful, sunny day there for those that are out enjoying the snow. We can see there the current weather, 14 degrees. Oh, that's Fahrenheit. Fahrenheit is no good for us but it is minus five in Banff, so probably a little chillier up right now at Sunshine Village. Actually, I had it pulled up. Minus six, yeah, just a little bit chillier in Sunshine Village. And that's out at Panorama, also a beautiful day. Look at that range in the background. And uh, you know, what a better way to celebrate International Mountain Day than uh, by looking at mountains in our areas. And our next guest, he's in Saskatoon. And, and I'll admit, we don't normally think of Saskatoon when we think of mountains. But Steve Mamet's research takes him to Churchill and to the Mackenzie Mountains. And he's a research associate with the University of Saskatchewan's Department of Soil Science. Hi, Steve. Hi, Megan. How are you? Great. Nice poster. Oh, thanks. I <laughs> randomly got it in the mail. Who'd have thunk? It just seemed to work out for today. <laughs> Wonderful. So tell me, tell us a bit about your research and what you do. Okay. So I'm, you know, as a researcher, I wear many hats, but if I had to generalize for today, I'd call myself a, a biogeographer. And I'm really interested in plant dynamics along environmental gradients. So a great place to find environmental gradients is to go up north where things get colder and colder or go further up into the mountains. So um, the main focus of my research is on uh, tree line and permafrost and interactions between the two. So I've been working up in Churchill for the last 14 years now and up in the Mackenzie Mountains for 11 years. And so the work that you're doing there, I mean, they're two different regions and, and you're seeing how, how the same phenomenon is affecting these different regions differently. Tell me what, what it's like and, and what you're seeing what's happening in the Mackenzie Mountains. So in the Mackenzie Mountains, uh, like a lot of tree lines across the circumboreal, you, you sort of expect to have this united front of trees moving northward or further up slope, uh, but there's actually a lot of variability in that the Mackenzie's is no exception. So my PhD work up there, I did a, an observational study looking at the, the tree line population. So we cored the trees, we looked at what the ages were and how they changed through time. We found that up until the 1950s and prior to 1980s, we had uh, trees moving further up slope and further north in the area. And it's it's virtually stopped for the, the conifer trees, the fir trees up there. Well, uh, deciduous trees have started to work their way up the, the road. So what we think is going on there is that uh, the timing of the trees stop, stopping their sort of movement into the area has coincided with uh, the establishment and increased growth of a lot of shrubs. So it's almost like something else has sort of taken up the real estate before the trees have had a chance to get in there. So up to the mid 20, 20th century, <laughs> we had uh, trees moving further north, but now it's largely stagnated for the, the key player trees up there, the, the fir trees. And what exactly does that mean for the region if the shrubs are moving in where, where trees would normally have been moving in as, as temperatures changed? Yeah, it, uh, it means the potential for a lot of other changes. So uh, we actually expected that, so we wanted to get at some of the mechanisms that are actually, uh, that shrubs influence tree establishment in the area and as the shrubs move up slope, they actually allow things that eat seeds to move up slope as well. So even if a seed does get to a nice uh, portion of habitat that it could actually grow, it's probably going to get eaten before it even has a, a chance to survive. And so that's for the trees. For the, the permafrost, we find that the shrubs, uh, because they, they trap snow in the wintertime and snow is an insulator, you get warmer temperatures. And so we actually have thicker active layers. So that's the the maximum depth of thaw that forms each year. And so we get active, thicker active layers, so thicker areas of thaw in the permafrost, but we find that it's actually a lot more stable in these areas where we have shrubs. Uh, compared to the areas where there aren't shrubs, we find that because we've been recording thaw depth for the last nearly 30 years, we can see a nice uh, trend as they're getting thicker, but they're getting thicker faster in the areas without shrubs. So. There's some 
sort of uh, stabilizing effects of shrubs in one sense. And uh, I'll chime in on another area that's, that would be of interest to people, I think, is that as the shrubs move in, they outcompete some of the ground vegetation, like lichens. And lichens are a, a big food source for the caribou up there. So as you get these shrubs covering up these areas, essentially covering the buffet that the, the caribou would be using. And so that could be one of the reasons why we're actually seeing less caribou up there in recent years. Wow, so widespread effects with, with everything that you guys are finding in terms of those changes. Uh, I wanted to ask you about the teams that you work with too, because you're a researcher, but you also work with, with citizen scientists through a group called Earthwatch International. And I was wondering if you could tell me a little bit about that program and the type of work that, that these volunteers do with you. Oh, definitely. So it just so happens, in addition to having this poster up, I shamelessly wore this T-shirt today. <laughs> So uh, Earthwatch International has been around for the last 45-ish years. They started in the 1970s, and they're the largest uh, environmental charity out there. So what they do is they uh, search out funds and essentially people to support uh, long-term environmental research. So I've been working with them. Uh, our project has been associated with them since the early 2000s, but I've been working with Earthwatch since 2003. And so what they do is they'll, in addition to providing funding, they provide, uh, they collect people that are interested in going on what we call a working vacation. And they get to go to uh, places where they've never been before. And there's Earthwatch projects all around the globe. And they'll come up with me and basically uh, get to live 10 days in the life of a field researcher. So we're on the ground for 10 days each year or 10 days each trip and they'll help me collect a lot of measurements at a lot of different sites so we can get that uh, replication that we need to have a good idea of uh, what the conditions are and then also uh, collect those those data in a very short period of time so that we know that the seasons change very quickly and we'd like to get a snapshot at the same time each year mm -hmm. and collect these long-term records that we're able to get sort of a baseline to compare the changes that we're seeing recently to some, some sort of baseline. So basically we need to know where we've been to know where we're going and it wouldn't be possible to collect such a, a breadth and depth of information if we didn't have these uh, sometimes called them sub-zero heroes <laughs> or these citizen scientists that, that come up and help us collect those data. And then the uh, added bonus of that is that it's uh, it's great for instantaneous outreach. So you don't need to wait for a paper to be published or say for the, the media to get a hold of you know some of your work. People can come up and they, they see the data being collected and we do some uh, analyses right on site and they get to see these changes for themselves. So it's not sort of like a nebulous change that's happening as they, they read a paper and oh, something's happening in the North. They're actually there and seeing it and measuring it, which is, I think, going to be very crucial moving forward with uh, environmental monitoring studies is that outreach. And so I know that there's another expedition that's being planned in the near future that people can apply for. Uh, tell me more about that. Oh, definitely. So um, we do have trips to, to Churchill, but the, the one that I'm really plugging our uh, <laughs> recruit button for is uh, every August we go to the Mackenzie Mountains and we, we spend 10 days there and we measure uh, permafrost characteristics, download weather stations, and uh, also collect data for our experimental study uh, called the Global Treeline Range Expa Expansion Experiment, which you can uh, Google and find uh, the website. And yeah, if you're, if you're interested in, in joining, then uh, you can have a look at the details of another shameless plug here. I don't know if my screen is tiny. It just looks like chicken scratches. But <laughs> if you can see it, you can go uh, to earthwatch.com and look up uh, climate change in the Mackenzie Mountains. And you'll find uh, more information on how you can get involved. And I would highly recommend it because it's one of the most beautiful places I've ever been to, in addition to being really interesting scientifically. Well, it's always nice when it's both, right? <laughs> oh, yeah. I wouldn't have it any other way. Is there a, a particular memory or story or a moment in the field that, that kind of sticks with you from your research? Yeah, I had to, I could think of a lot of moments that uh, have been uh, quite 
I don't know, entertaining or definitely memorable. And uh, I actually had to think outside my, my research to get one that would be a little more crowd friendly. <laughs> <laughs> so in addition to working in the north and in the mountains, uh, when I lived in Alberta, I was a, an avid uh, backcountry skier. And so we had uh, tried to do this, this epic ski trip uh, called the Great Divide Traverse, where we ski from Jasper to Lake Louise. And we made it to the first of many ice fields called the Hooker Ice Field. And uh, we, we got stuck up there for a while and it was whiteout conditions and, and quite awful. And, and while I was on this trip, I learned uh, two things about fun in the backcountry. I learned that there's three types of fun. There's um, type one fun, which is fun as you're doing it. There's type two fun that it's fun as soon as you've stopped doing it. And then there's type three fun that maybe after several months go by and some of the memories have faded, <laughs> then th those memories become fun again. And I also learned that there's something called sidekick syndrome. <laughs> and what that is, is where uh, anything bad that happens will happen to one person. That you, They just sort of be this lightning rod. And uh, I'll just tell a quick story of one of the ways I learned that was, uh, so we had to have 10 days worth of food on our, on our back as we were skiing uh, in between these caches. And uh, tried to ski through, uh, you know, and breaking trail through snow with basically 100 pounds on your back is quite difficult. And I fell down a lot. And at one point, I actually tried to step over a fallen tree, tripped and fell and slid down a slope head first into a, a stream. And it actually could have been a lot more serious than it was because trying to get your backpack off with skis on, um, <laughs> it's it's not that easy, not easy. but <laughs> no, not at all. And so, uh, the, the long and short of it is that, that I got wet. Uh, my my avalanche shovel fell out of my bag and washed away. And uh, I had very cleverly, you know, put my lunch in a Ziploc bag so it wouldn't get wet just in case something weird like that happened. But of course, I didn't seal it. So my, my lunch was just a bag of uh, soggy food. Soggy. Stuff. Yeah. And uh, that's just one of the many things that uh, helped me, you know, these more experienced people I was skiing with, they they let me know that I, I had a very severe case of sidekick syndrome. <laughs> so that's, I don't know if that's, if that's a good story or not, but it's definitely a story that comes to mind when I'm thinking of uh, my time spent in the mountains. And now it's, that would definitely be type three fun because I look back with such fondness on that trip, but at the time, not at all. <laughs> that's fair. <laughs> And I mean, in terms of your research, part of the reason that, that you took on the Mackenzie Mountain Research Project was that your, your thesis supervisor had been doing that work and he sort of bequeathed it to you. So I'm now curious, as, as you've been in on this for, for a while now and you're continuing your work in the Mackenzie Mountains, when you see yourself handing off this research down the line, uh, what's your hope for it? Where do you hope it'll be or, or what do you hope you can hand off to the next, the next generation of researchers? Oh, that would be the dream. Well, this uh, long-term environmental monitoring is really, uh, in a lot of ways, under undervalued and underfunded because, you know, if you're a funding agency, you want to see uh, results very quick, and it's sort of hard to get that when you're looking at something like climate change that, you know, changes over decades to centuries. So, uh, I would hope to keep the the work going because some of the things we found uh, we wouldn't have been able to find if we hadn't had this long term record that we've been collecting since the the 1990s. So I do have a, a little bit of a fantasy of having a uh, you know gray hair and maybe there'll be more of it for some reason <laughs> once I you know reach my my late sixties and handed it off to young some young whippersnapper that's got. Uh, you know, great visions of, of where to take the research in the future. So that would be my hope. But in the meantime, I'd hope that uh, uh, the work we're doing, we're, we're publishing and we're also working with various different agencies to, you know, make sure that these data aren't just collected and mothballed and therefore, you know, sort of ivory tower work, uh, but that they actually have uh, real, real world and applied uses for, you know, if you're interested in modern animal populations or vegetation modern, we, we hope that uh, the work we're doing is gonna contribute something to that as well. So the plan is the, the long game, <laughs> but we'll, we'll see what happens. 
That's fair. Well, thank you so much, Steve, for joining us and for sharing a bit of your research and your, your from your corners, I guess we could say, of Canada where you're doing your work. Oh, thanks so much for having me. That's Steve Mamet, and he is a research associate with the University of Saskatchewan. He's based in Saskatoon. Let's head to another webcam and check a look at the snow levels right now in Glacier National Park. As we look at the snowboard, there has not been much new snow in the last little while. But if we look behind the snowboard, which is designed for cap capturing snow and seeing how much there's been, we can actually see it is a beautiful, sunny and snowy day in the west end of Glacier National Park. We'll head to another quick webcam, take a look at uh, what's going on over at, uh, we're back at Panorama. So a view from up the hill, we can see a beautiful sunny day there. And this one is the Canmore Clubhouse webcam. So we can see the three sisters there, just right through the trees in a beautiful, beautiful sunny day in Canmore right now where it's about uh, minus four, minus three degrees and beautiful out. Our next guest is coming to us from Crow's Nest Pass, Alberta, and we'll be connecting with Fred Bradley. Hi, Megan. So, I mean, for those of, that don't know you, Fred, you're a local heritage and community activist. You're a former, or maybe I should say recovering politician, and uh, you're also one of the That's organizers correct. for the first ever Crow's Nest Spirit Festival that wraps up today. So tell us a bit about that festival and, and how it came to be. Well, actually, we uh, a group of us, uh, two or three of us, got together uh, about just less than a month ago after Matthew Barry had suggested we might want to participate in International Mountain Day. So we had formed a small organizing committee: the Crow's Nest uh, Nordic Ski Club, Crow's Nest Outdoors, the Pass Powder Keg Ski Club, Crow's Nest Conservation Group, and the Crow's Nest Heritage Initiative. And we thought we've got a lot of mountain culture here in the Crow's Nest Pass. Uh, we got a lot of outdoor activities, we got a lot of hi history, a lot of artistic uh, people here. So we thought we could uh, come up with a our own festival to celebrate International Mountain Day. And we came up with the idea of Crow's Nest uh, Mountain Spirit Festival as the concept. So we've only had less than, less than uh, a month to organize this. And uh, I think we've heard, we've had a very successful weekend so far. Wonderful. And in terms of the events that you planned for the weekend, what was going on there? Well, we started off on Saturday night or Friday night with the uh, first um, ski uh, night skiing at the Pass Powder Keg Ski Hill. Uh, followed up on Saturday, we had a, uh, uh, a gear check day at the Allison Chinook uh, uh, cross-country ski area sponsored by the Crow's Nest Nordic Ski Club. They had hot chocolate, they had waxing benches, people had opportunities to tune up their skis and go out in some small hikes and they had a campfire with uh, uh, hot chocolate and homemade soup. Um, later that evening we had a really exciting event that uh, put on by Lisa Canair, uh, uh, outdoor mountain photography, mountain bound photography, had over 38 people participate in a night hike up to the top of the uh, past powder keg ski hill to watch the Gemini meteorite shower and take nighttime photography. They also had a campfire up there and hot chocolate, so that sounded like an excellent event. Yesterday, the uh, Crow's Nest Outdoors had a, a hike up on the Big Bear uh, ski, uh, Big Bear, I guess, actually a mountain bike trail. We were going to do some snowshoeing down here, but it's been really, it's been really warm down here. I think it's only minus two today, but it was in the plus ten to fifteen of the week. Oh, wow. We altered some of our activities to hikes. <laughs> they had a great hike. They had 50 people participate. Um, and I think we're going to see some pictures of that later on. Also, that afternoon the, in Bellevue, the Bellcrest community had their first uh, Bell, Bellevue uh, Light Festival. And they had a number of Christmas activities Santa Claus uh, party with the children, fire truck rides, uh, again, outdoor campfires and uh, hot chocolate and shared. A lot of food and stories and then they lit up the town and they're looking at actually uh their goal is to have a million lights on the main street of bellevue in the future but this is their first attempt at that. so that would sound like a great activity and uh to this afternoon actually the cpr uh, christmas train is arriving in coleman so that's sort of an added feature for international mountain day and that's happening at 1 15. and then tonight we have an event at the crow's nest or at the frank slide interpretive center 
uh, two guest lectures. Peter Sherrington talking about the eagle, golden eagle migration along the Livingston Range, which is the world's largest uh, recorded number of golden eagles seen from one spot. Um, and then followed by a, a lecture about the buzz about wild bees by Megan Evans. So uh, that's sort of our first attempt at the Crow's Nest uh, Mountain Spirit Festival honoring International Mountain Day. Well, I think it's a pretty fantastic first shot at it. For those of you that just saw the photos behind some really fun activities, people getting outside and enjoying enjoying the great outdoors. And I know that Fred, one of the activities this weekend was to ask people what Crow's Nest Mountain Spirit meant to them. And I was wondering if there were any answers that really stuck out for you. Well, I, I have a whole bunch, uh, actually, <laughs> Megan. We have a contest on uh, being what does Crow's Nest Mountain Spirit mean to you? And we're going to, Bound for Mountain Photography is going to donate a, a print we're going to draw tonight at the Frank Side Interpreter Center. So there's still chances for people to participate. But Karen Davies Wilson said, seeing the sun rise and fall every day in the beautiful mountains, especially my favorite Crow's Nest Mountain, and knowing that I'm home. Daniel Harris said, quirky things like random snow on the first week of school. And then the community we live in. I love our community and we can all laugh a little when it snows in September. I think it's part of what makes the mountain living so amazing and unpredictable. Jordan Nathaniel, Nathaniel Brown said, Crow's Nest Mountain Spirit to me means paradise. It's our escape from work and life to a place where time can slow down and we can enjoy each other's company in one of the most beautiful yet affordable places of the country. A truly hidden gem, which I'm glad we found. Kimberly Uhersky said, the combination of feeling of freedom and of awe when I take in the amazing view of the mountains with the pink, pink sky in the background on my way to work in the morning and the refreshing feeling I get when I breathe the deep, deeply the mountain air. There's nothing else like it. One of my, I've got two more here. Mm -hmm. uh, Carolee Sivitrice, mm -hmm. Crow's Nest Mountain Spirit means stepping outside your front door during a rainstorm and smelling the fresh pine and sweet smells of our beautiful mountain town. It's shoveling snow so deep that the mountains could be made. It's tasting the cold, pure flavor of our crystal blue waters. It's knowing that each trail could lead to a new adventure with your family. It's years and years of unique cultures wrapped up in our five towns. It's feeling blessed each morning I wake up knowing I'm so lucky to raise both my children in this wonderful place. And then finally, one of my favorites, Crow's Nest Mountain Spirit is a testament to the enduring power of time, weather, spiritual history, and natural beauty that never ceases to amaze and inspire respect and humility to all who eyes to gaze upon what it is. Well, so that that's, uh, sort of sums up some of the comments that people put on our, our, our website contest to say, what does Posenest Mountain Spirit mean to you? Those are some fantastic answers, and I feel like that last quote it just ties in to my last question for you, which is, I know that you've been a, a fierce supporter that the Crow's Nest Pass should become a UNESCO World Heritage Site. Uh, we saw some photos as you were reading those, those, those thoughts about Mountain Spirit, and so we can see how beautiful the area is. But what's your, what's your case? Tell us why you think that the pass should be a UNESCO World Heritage Site. Well, it starts, I guess, with Crow's Nest Mountain being one of the iconic mountains of the, of the um, well, actually, the, the thought is to be, the Crow's Nest Pass is a unique cultural, natural, historic landscape. And, and there's a number of, of segments to that and makes it unique in terms of, of UNESCO designation. They have cultural or natural. We're sort of a combination of both uh, the effect of, of man's uh, settlement on the area over the period of years. But Crow's Nest Mountain is an iconic is one of the iconic mountains of the of the Canadian Rockies in terms of it just stands out uh, as no other mountain stands out, I believe. So that's I'm sort of a little biased there. <laughs> uh, but it was a spiritual mountain to the Blackfoot people, the Pagan people. It was one of their three Vision Quest mountains. The other two being the United States, Chief Mountain, the Sweet Grass Hills. But it always had that traditional spiritual mountain aspect to the to our, indig our indigenous people, but it continues to be a spiritual mountain uh, to the people who live here today. We have a rich uh, cultural history here of uh, uh, settlement patterns by, by mankind, and it goes back to indigenous settlement that goes back over 8,000 years, actually. So um, the, there was, there's archeological, we have the richest, 
number of ar pre-European archaeological sites in a mountain pass in Canada, we believe. And it goes back to the early settlements at Crow's Nest Lake. Uh, on the Livingston Range, there is a Vision Quest site, or not a Vision Quest site, but a, a quarry site, a church quarry site, where, where a church was mined for Indian um, arrowhead, arrowheads and tools. And that goes back two or 3,000 years. And just above that is this, this Livingston Range flyway where Peter Sherrington has seen all these eagles and all these birds where this large recording of the golden eagles has taken place. But that's the indigenous, the, the European settlement. Uh, coal mining is certainly a big part of our tradition. Uh, rum running, uh, prohibition. We have just opened the Alberta French Police Barracks Museum, which tells about the shooting of a constable during the rum running era. And uh, the opera Philomena was based on that. Um, a large number, our ethnic cultural uh, community here, probably in terms of settlement of Western Canada communities, we had over 42 nationalities settled here and they had a great influence on the community, number of ethnic halls, but also the tradition of the Crow's Nest Symphony Orchestra, which is the oldest amateur uh, uh, symphony orchestra, I think in Canada that still is playing, uh, performing, uh, same with Alberta. And then our ecology, well, we, we the this, Crozenest Pass is a unique uh, transitional zone in terms of flora and fauna species. Uh, we are a transitional zone for species from British Columbia going from, from west to east through the pass into Alberta, and a north-south transition zone of species from southern species going north uh, to the, where this, that's the southernmost exposure of some species and the northernmost of others. So this transition zone is, is unique. So these are some of the, uh, the, the unique history of this area, Frank Slide, for example, um, at the Frank Slide Interpreter Center, they monitor the movement of that mountain, the geological perspective. We have the Lewis Thrust Fault that goes through here. We have um, karst caves, the gargantuan caverns. Um, and then we have all this outdoor activity, which I think is showcased in some of the photos. Um, you know, we have some mountain bike trails that are being developed, international mountain bike standards. We have hiking trails. Uh, we have all these outdoor activities, snowshoeing, cross-country skiing, downhill skiing, snowmobiling, and we even have a started ski joring here in February. So there's a lot to celebrate here about our mountain, mountain culture, but also this unique uh, natural features, historical features, cultural features, I think can lend itself with, and I know it can take a lot of time to do all the research and bring down all the, put together all these facts, but I think we have a unique uh, historical mountain, historical natural cultural landscape here that we need to think about and manage into the future and part of that is how do you manage this landscape and appreciate all the values which we have here and uh, our mountain culture and how we celebrate that and how we maintain it into the future for sure well thank you so much for sharing a bit of your corner of the world with us fred and a very happy international mountain day to you well, thank you very much, and the same to you. And having watched what the other participants put together, I'm sure next year we will have some uh, interesting uh, videos and other uh, other aspects of our mountain culture life, which we celebrate here, to share with you and the International Mountain Day Network. And thank you very much for having us participate today. Thank you, Megan. Oh, thank you so much, Fred. And if you are in the Crow's Nest Pass area, you can head to their Birds and Bees lecture at 7 o'clock that Fred had mentioned. That's at the Frank Slide Interpretive Center, and that's where guest speakers Peter Sherrington and Megan Evans will be talking about the migration of golden eagles, but also wild bees, hence the birds and the bees. There have been a lot of activities for International Mountain Day around Canada, around the world, and the Canadian Mountain Network has been hosting a bunch themselves. And earlier this week, on December 6th, there was a panel discussion ranging on a variety of issues related to mountain ranges. And uh, here's a taste of some of the activities that were happening at the University of Alberta. So where I'm starting with this uh, initiative is uh, a look at uh, contaminants and berries. And uh, there's a number of berries that are important uh, to First Nations peoples uh, here in Alberta. And also beavers. And uh, so beavers have kind of a special place in my heart for reasons that I will explain. Uh, but I'm thinking there's an opportunity here uh, to also use uh, beavers as uh, a kind of a natural biomonitor 
of, of ecosystem health. But in the last decade, there's a new technology that's uh, come along. Uh, you've probably heard of trail cameras. And these are just cameras that are about the size of a regular camera that's put out in the field, and it, it is able then to take a picture of these animals when they pass in front of, in front of the camera, and that has become the new standard, uh, or is becoming the new standard for monitoring many of these large mammals, mid and large mammals. And that's what I'm going to talk about today, is just some of the methods that are used for tracking these uh, key species. So since we've begun, we've had um, about 14 camps. Um, so we include the language, we include having elders there, we include having um, researchers there, we have people coming in and dissecting fish, and explaining what's going on with our fish, because we've, we do have researchers from I think three different universities. Um, we were part of the tracking change um, uh, that U of A is doing. So I got to go to Thailand as a part of my job, which was amazing. And I got to learn about um, the land, I mean the water in the Mackenzie River Basin. And so this program kind of does a lot of different amazing things and has a lot of different, we built a lot of really amazing relationships with different schools and different people and um, different researchers. So. A bit of a taste of some of the events for International Mountain Day and the festivities this past week. And right now, if you're in Calgary, right now there's an activity around bison reintroduction, celebra celebrating the introduction of bison to Banff National Park. That's happening at the John Dutton Theatre at the Calgary Central Library. And right after this, uh, this live stream, actually starting in the next few minutes, it's going to be a presentation called Living with Wildlife. It's going to be a screening of the film as well as a filmmaker Q&A, and that's also at the John Dutton Theatre. And uh, on the topic of bison, and also on the topic of celebrating mountains year-round, it's not just the International Mountain Day live stream that the Canadian Mountain Network does, there's also a Canadian Mountain podcast. And I wanted to share a little piece with you of the most recent podcast that's just gone up, and it's looking at the reintroduction of bison to Banff National Park. This is, you'll see me interviewing uh, William Snow as well as Marie-Ève Marchand uh, from Bison Belong, and they're talking about the effects of bringing bison Banff to National Park. Take a look. Buffalo have been in the Bow Valley for many years. Uh, going back, uh, there have been remains found within Banff National Park uh, going back at least 10,000 years. And uh, a lot of that history is really not known. And uh, I think that uh, you know there's more publications uh, and more research being done on, on bison in, uh, in different areas. And that's good. And uh, you know, we, we need to really take a second look at all of the, the, the history of, uh, of uh, wildlife within uh, important corridors like the Bow Valley. We're bringing them back to be wild, to be free, not to be fenced anymore. And that's the first time in over 140 years that this time in Banff, within a few months, they will be roaming around the valleys of the Pender. Wow. Well, I think this is uh, uh, part of a, a process uh, that's been underway for a number of years. This is not the first time that Parks has tried to bring uh, buffalo into into the parks, uh, and those efforts previously uh, did not involve a lot of uh, First Nations or other groups in order to try and uh, facilitate that. Uh, and so this time around, in this this cycle of trying to uh, reintroduce bison into the, the national parks, uh, we we began talking early on with parks and parks I think reached out to a lot of different groups uh, to get their take on on how how this should be done and I think the one of the reasons why it should be done is because of all of the uh, functions that Buffalo perform on landscapes uh, all of the biodiversity that buffaloes bring with them uh, being on part of the landscape uh, Wes Olson talks a lot about this in his work. Uh, all of the different types of uh, insects, uh, all of the different other ungulates, uh, fish species, birds that naturally come into areas where bison are normally habitating. And so I think for all of those kind of uh, reasons, 
for strengthening biodiversity, I think that's a really important part of, of, of why it's done. Uh, the other why as to why it's done is also cultural. Uh, indigenous people have, have uh, regarded the bison as a, a very important part of uh, the culture. Um, bison skulls are still used today in, in many of the important ceremonies. And because of that, uh, the bison has always had a special place, uh, not only within the culture, but as a religious symbol for many indigenous uh, nations. And so for that reason, uh, and, and for all of the other intangibles that are associated with, uh, with buffalo, uh, I think that's another reason why uh, it gains support to, to bring uh, bison back to the, the, the landscape of uh, Bath National Park. It's a taste of the Canadian Mountain Podcast, those last shots there. Yes, the bison were airlifted into Banff National Park almost a year ago, this past February. And if you want to find out more about the reintroduction of bison to Banff National Park or the importance of bison in that region, or even if you just want to see inside that teepee that you saw the shot of, you can find it all on the latest podcast episode of the Canadian Mountain Podcast. And you can find that all at canadianmountainnetwork.ca. And that wraps up our International Mountain Day live stream. Thank you so much for joining me today. I'm Meg Wilcox from the University of Alberta at Edmonton, or in Edmonton. And uh, if you want any more information on International Mountain Day, you can always head to, to internationalmountainday.ca. Don't forget, if you're going to post anything online, use the hashtag MountainsMatterCA. Special thanks to our participants, to Meg Wilcox, our host, and to the University of Alberta and the Faculty of Science for supporting this podcast. 